Okay, today we're going to be talking primarily about the 1980s and 1990s, but I want to go back in time a little bit to see the setup. We've been discussing the theory of liberalism in the work of John Rawls and the theory of conservatism and libertarianism in the work of Robert Nozick. What I want to now do is give you a sense of how things developed. Um, the 60s were a time of great cultural change, but also great prosperity. However, things in the 70s, although they got off to a very promising start, quickly spun out of control and really made the country hungry for a new kind of leadership. So here we see people who are, were presidents during that era, Richard Nixon, Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford, and then Ronald Reagan, who was elected in 1980. So let's start with Nixon. Nixon is the person who described Eisenhower, under whom he served as vice president, as complex and devious. And by almost every account, Nixon himself was a complex and devious man. He won pretty resoundingly in 1968. It was a close election, but one of those that didn't look so close in the electoral college. The electoral vote was significant, even though it was 43.2% of the vote to 42.6% of the vote in popular vote. So it was a very narrow victory. The South went for George Wallace, who ran as a third party candidate. Um, and nevertheless, within a few years, this is how it looked county by county. But Nixon initially had really a significant number of achievements, uh, landing people on the moon, which happened in 1969, removing US troops from Vietnam, ending the draft, <coughs> opening up relations with China, and then a practice of detente with the Soviet Union, doing a lot to wind down the tensions of the Cold War. There was a strategic arms limitation treaty, uh, also an anti-ballistic missile treaty. So there were a number of achievements that helped, especially in foreign affairs, which was really Nixon's main specialty, that helped to diffuse tensions. And so at least initially, Nixon was actually quite a popular president. Um, in fact, he was re-elected overwhelmingly in 1972. Um, and I'll show you, oh, there he is in China, meeting with Zhou Enlai. And here you see the electoral map in 1972. It was rather lopsided. <laughs> Uh, yes? When did the color change happen? The first one you showed us, it was from like a textbook or something. But right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, really before the 2000 election. The common way of representing these things was to represent the Republicans in blue and the Democrats in red. And in 2000, the media changed it so that the blue states became the Democratic states and the red states were Republican. Um, why? 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 That's so intuitively wrong to someone who's grown up with that. Republican is red. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, <laughs> they wanted it's very odd. All of the maps I grew up with were like this. The Republicans were always blue. OK? Um, so they retroactively changed it? So they retro yeah, they re retroactively changed it all. <laughs> and so if you go to these historical sites now, they've changed it all so it goes the other way. Uh, my own view is that the <coughs> Democrats didn't like the allegation that they were in some sense red. And so, <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, I really don't understand it. In 2000, that just dramatically shifted from everything that had been done before for reasons that no one ever explained. It was, and, and in fact, at the time, no one seemed to notice it. It was kind of like, well, it's always been this way, hasn't it? Well, no, it wasn't. Four years ago, it wasn't this way. It was never this way. So, yeah, it's quite perplexing. But I'm glad you noticed that because, in fact, there's a, yeah, there's a dramatic shift here in the way the parties are represented just in terms of color. In any event, 1972, if you look at it county by county, was even more dramatic. There are <laughs> very few places where the Democratic candidate came out ahead. And notice that the darker the red, the stronger the Republican advantage. So actually, um, the, what, the areas here that look dark red were very, very <laughs> Republican. How was the popular vote that close, though? Oh, it, it really... I mean, it was 60.7% to 37.5%. So actually, it wasn't very close. Yeah, no, it was not, as, not nearly as dramatic as the election <coughs> vote, but it was still pretty overwhelming. Now, the press nevertheless hated Nixon. They had hated Nixon ever since the House on American Activities Committee, the Elder Hiss case around 1950. Um, and that he became president, that was bad enough. But then that he was reelected so overwhelmingly and was actually becoming popular. <coughs> Um, the press, it drove the press crazy. One editor said, there's got to be a bloodletting. We've got to make sure nobody ever thinks of doing this again. And the Watergate scandal followed. It began during the 1972 campaign with a break-in at Democratic headquarters in Washington. Uh, nothing was really stolen. Uh, it was a foiled sort of thing. 
Um, but the allegation was that Nixon somehow knew about this. Not that he had planned it, not that he was in on the actual activity, but that somehow he covered this up. And this dragged on the press for more than two years. There was a famous, uh, it turned out Nixon was recording everything that happened in the Oval Office. Um, there was a crucial recording where he was discussing with Ehrlichman and Haldeman uh, the Watergate allegations and so forth. And the tape went silent for 18 and a half minutes, um, something that people thought was a sign of a misdeed, that somehow in that 18 and a half minutes, something crucial had been said and then later deleted and so on. In any event, it really led to a constitutional crisis. It wasn't just the media against the president. It was also really, in a sense, who has the responsibility for this? Um, what does it mean to obstruct justice and so forth? There was a general loss of faith in leadership. Not only a loss of faith in Nixon, but a loss of faith, you might say, in all of the government institutions that were involved in this. Right around the same time, there was a major shock. The 1973 oil embargo sent gasoline prices and energy prices in general in the United States skyrocketing. Skyrocketing. You can see here that before 1973, oil was at or under $10 a barrel. It suddenly went up to $50 a barrel. Okay, five times increase overnight. Gasoline at the pump went from 19 to 25 cents a gallon to suddenly the shocking amount of $1.25 a gallon. Uh, now, all of that seems inexpensive to us today, but think about the, I remember a place not far from where I lived in the late 60s where gasoline really was 19 cents a gallon. And things suddenly uh, change very dramatically. Well, when energy becomes a lot more expensive, what else becomes a lot more expensive? Everything, everything that has to be transported, um, everything that has to be manufactured, energy is involved in using and making and, and distributing everything. And so it created huge inflationary pressures, it caused significant economic problems, and so the press attention to Watergate and those economic problems combined led to a sudden loss of faith and a sudden discouragement. Something very much like that happened again then in 1979 with the oil embargo that resulted from the Iranian hostage crisis. <coughs> At that point, oil had come back down to the low 40s. It skyrocketed up to $90 a barrel and caused a second major shock to the economy in the late 70s. Now, throughout the 70s, you can see here the record of the Dow Jones Industrial Average plummeting in 1932, coming back up and sinking for the latter part of the Depression. Coming back up gradually in 1950s, doing very well until about 1966. And then 1966 through 1982, it goes nowhere. Up and down, but really makes no progress at all. So it was a time of economic stagnation overall. And then you can see things dramatically changed around in 82 and went up to well, wherever this map, <laughs> this chart stops in the mid 2000s. Now, in 1960, 74, due to the Watergate scandal, Nixon resigned. Yes, question. Interesting fact, my great-grandfather actually was President Ford's legal advisor and handled the entire turnover between Nixon and Ford. Really? Yeah. Oh, so you must know intriguing stories about this. <laughs> Not really. My great-granddad died when I was about five or six years old, but we've got like a portrait of like all the presidents that were, like all five or six presidents that were alive at the time of President Ford's funeral were all signed and like we got to meet all of them and stuff. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, Gerald Ford um, became president, the only man to ever to serve in the office who was not elected as either president or vice president, um, which was an odd thing. Um, he was also probably the most athletic president we've ever had. Um, he was a football star at Michigan um, nevertheless, the press depicted him as a bumbler. Um, right, as soon as he uh, took over the office, he was getting out of a helicopter and bumped his head. And the press made a big deal out of that and basically treated him as if he was the kind of person you couldn't trust to walk down the stairs. <laughs> and so it's ironic given that he really was probably the most athletic president. But nevertheless, um, he became this sort of laughing stock in a way that had nothing to do with his actual accomplishments or anything else. In any event, there were a number of things that were important consequences of the Watergate scandal, of the Nixon resignation, and of the economic crisis. One of them was the War Powers Act. Congress tried to severely restrict the war-making power of the chief executive. Um, it also banned military involvement in Southeast Asia, and Congress cut off funds to South Vietnam. Now, Nixon had withdrawn US troops from South Vietnam at this time, but there remained some military advisors and extensive supplies <coughs> 
going to the South Vietnamese government of the South Vietnamese army. When the money flow was cut off, the South Vietnamese army was stranded. And shortly thereafter, Saigon fell. North Vietnam massed all of its troops available, including children. They were sending children to the South. They managed to surround Saigon and had overwhelming numerical superiority. There was no way for the South Vietnamese without supplies to hold out, and so Saigon fell. Here you see the last helicopter taking people out of Saigon before the North Vietnamese moved in. Uh, there were many more people, obviously, in line to get in that helicopter than to get on. Um, there was some fighting and clawing to be among the last to leave. Um, but here you see the scene at the, as people are trying to get on that helicopter, trying to reach out and get people on or keep people off. And <coughs> the result was a humanitarian disaster, in any case, in South Vietnam. Re-education camps, people who had fought in the South Vietnamese army or who were in any way affiliated with the South Vietnamese government were sent to these camps to be re-educated. Millions were involved. Millions of others tried to flee the country in makeshift boats to get to Malaysia, Indonesia, and other areas. Here's a photograph of the so-called boat people who left by the millions. There was also a human disaster in Cambodia, which was next door to Vietnam, and which was also then taken over by a communist revolution. This is a pile of bones in what became known as the Killing Fields. There's a very great movie about this called The Killing Fields which I highly recommend, although I've never been able to get my own family to watch it, because it's very depressing. In any event, <laughs> um, a group of intellectuals who had been educated in Paris, um, called the Khmer Rouge, um, promised what they called total social revolution in Cambodia uh, by, the, by means of what they referred to as necessary violence. They drove three million people out of the capital, Phnom Penh, into the countryside in a program of forced Ruralization, something like the collective farming imposed by Stalin. There were also simply mass murders. Something like 20% of the population was murdered directly, and another 20% died due to this ruralization program. All books were burned. Uh, well, I shouldn't say all, but almost all books were burned. Um, books in general were banned. Sex was prohibited. <laughs> Couples were prohibited from talking to each other, much less holding hands or kissing or anything of the sort. Uh, people were tortured, they were mutilated, they were executed uh, on a scale that was previously unimaginable. Um, here, preserved in a museum, actually, are skulls of victims from the killing fields. And, yeah, I don't know what to say about this, actually, except that, think about 40% of the population being murdered. The criteria here had nothing to do with, by the way, who you were, um, really, or what you had done. Um, possession of eyeglasses was something that would earn you a death sentence. It indicated that you were able to read, and if you could read, you were executed. They would give small children bowls of rice. Um, the upper class children, upper class, quote unquote, would have had spoons, okay, and so would have reached in with a spoon and then blown on the spoon to cool off the rice. The children who were really poor um, would have been eating rice with their hands. And so a poor child, given hot rice, would know, blow on the rice and wait. Whereas a child who had grown up with a spoon would think you could spoon in. And so they had a tendency to reach with their fingers into the hot rice. Anyway, that would be the test. If a small child, a two-year-old child, a three-year-old child, reached into the hot bowl of rice with his fingers before blowing on it to cool it off, the child would be beaten to death with a shovel. Um, and in fact, most of the people <laughs> executed were executed in that sort of fashion. Not actually from explosions or bullets or anything else, but just beaten to death. Um, because it was cheaper than doing, <laughs> than actually using ammunition. Um, <coughs> now, in the late 70s, mid to late 70s, there were a series of meetings about human rights, and this issued in the signing of the Helsinki Accords. Um, this promised to protect human rights, and it was signed by the Soviet Union, among other countries. At the time, this was thought um, to be highly hypocritical, but nevertheless, it did give a moral foundation to dissidents in Eastern Europe and in the USSR. It wasn't something that changed things dramatically overnight, but it did give people something to appeal to. They could say, wait a minute, you're not living up to the promises that you yourself have made. And so eventually, it was something that did have a significant impact. It promised sovereign equality. It promised not to use force. It promised to respect the territorial integrity of states. This should remind you of something. Well, the UN. Well, yes, the UN, but also this 
<coughs> promising peaceful Kellogg settlement. Brand <laughs> yes, the Kellogg Brand Act, exactly. It prom it, it's reminiscent of that, and it was similar in a certain sense, no direct effect, but on the other hand, indirect effects that ended up being quite significant in this case. Now, Jimmy Carter became president. Uh, he was elected in 1976, <coughs> took office in 1977. He promoted arms control, which is something that Nixon had done before him. Um, by then, it was becoming clear that the Soviet Union was violating treaties, and so there was a significant internal debate in the United States about the extent to which arms control was worth pursuing, but he was committed to this. He also tied foreign policy heavily to human rights. He thought it was important to encourage other countries to respect human rights, okay, along with the Helsinki Accords, and so mostly that led to a criticism of friends and allies, because after all, there was no point in criticizing your enemies. Uh, they weren't going to do it anyway. This did estrange Brazil, Argentina, a number of other Latin American countries especially. On the other hand, it did again strengthen the moral foundation that was eventually to lead to the overthrow of the Soviet Union and various communist governments in Eastern Europe. Um, he cooperated, basically, with <coughs> forces that um, overthrew the Shah in Iran. And as we know, that didn't work out terribly well. In fact, the revolutionary forces seized the American embassy in November of 1979, and shortly thereafter, the USSR invaded Afghanistan. I remember that very clearly. I was watching the news about all of that at the APA when I was job-seeking um, in December of 1979. The invasion of Afghanistan was taking place at the time. Here is a scene of executions during the Iranian Revolution. The Ayatollah Khomeini, who took power, um, the seizure of the U.S. Embassy. <laughs> you might recognize this man. He's widely thought to be Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who is now president of Iran. <laughs> um, the embassy staff hostages were taken and held for more than a year. In 1980, there was a failed rescue attempt. Carter sent helicopters to try to rescue people, um, and they crashed in the desert. It, was, it be kind of became a symbol of failure of Carter's policies. There is the USSR invasion of Afghanistan. In any case, the economy, partly due to energy shocks, partly due to other factors, was suffering. <coughs> By the end of the Carter administration, the misery index, which is the unemployment rate added to the inflation rate, was at an all-time high of over 20%. Um, and there was a sense that the country was really spinning out of control, no longer in control of the international situation, no longer in control of the economy. As you can see, the 70s were not a great time in general. Uh, the Ford administration also had its serious problems with inflation. By the end of the Carter administration, inflation was in double digits, so was unemployment. Things looked very bad. Sorry? Reagan time. Ah, yes, and you can see it dramatically turned around uh, during the 1980s. There. <laughs> okay, so now we're up to 1980. And you can sense perhaps some of the hunger to do things differently. The 70s felt in many ways as if it was a reductio ad absurdum of certain economic policies, certain policies in foreign affairs, even though to some extent it was driven by uh, contingent events that maybe nobody had much control over. Certainly the oil shocks were not really the result of any specific policy. However that may be, um, there was a change in the late 70s and early 80s, not only here but in a number of Western European countries, that might be called the 1980s counter-revolution. Paul Johnson has written about it this way. It was essentially the work of outstanding popular leaders um, who mirrored the thoughts, desires, and faith of ordinary men and women. It really was a popular movement in many ways. There was this strong sense, um, exemplified by what? By the reaction to what has been referred to as Carter's Malay speech. I remember sitting through that speech in 1980, where he essentially said the country has sunken into a malaise. He didn't use that term. Other people used it in reaction to the speech. But he was essentially blaming the American people, saying, yes, I know your spirits are low, and it's your fault. Buck up, be brave, and so on. And it really made people angry. Um, and so there was a strong desire for leaders who would exercise some significant leadership and be optimistic. And a number of those leaders did emerge. One of them was Pope John Paul II, somebody who had a huge impact on the scene in Europe. This was a pope who himself was the first non-Italian pope in a very long time, the first Polish pope in a very long time, uh, maybe ever, actually, now that I stop and think about it. <laughs> His name was Karol Wojtyla. He was a philosopher, interestingly enough. Um, he was, yeah, the first Slavic pope in general. He was also the youngest pope since 1846. Um, he championed realism 
as opposed to the kind of, I don't know, religion in the 1970s had become kind of vague, kind of symbolic. He championed realism. He was himself religiously as well as politically conservative. He championed a return to authority and a restoration of traditional Catholicism, something that had undergone significant changes in the 60s and 70s. And Johnson writes about the dog that didn't bark. Nietzsche had declared God dead 100 years before, but all of a sudden, religious belief wasn't disappearing. In fact, it seemed, there seemed to be a resurgence. More than 200 million people attended the Pope's services, taken together, and the largest crowd ever recorded in human history was three and a half million people who went to a mass in Poland that he held. Um, I don't actually know how you gather three and a half million people anywhere, but that's a remarkable fact. He was also somebody who lent support to the Polish Revolution. And there you see the leader of the Polish Revolution, Lech Walesa. He was simply a dock worker in Gdansk, but he led a group known as Solidarity that actually ended up overthrowing the communist government of Poland. Gradually through a strike that spread from one shipyard to another and that ended up bringing down the government. The second of these leaders was Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher became prime minister in Great Britain. She had been involved in British politics for a very long time. Um, here you see her as a young woman. And she was known as the Iron Lady. Uh, her enemies actually gave her that title, but she loved it. Um, she was known as Britain's fighting lady, and she took on the unions in one of her first acts. But throughout the 70s, strikes were a serious problem in the United States, but especially in Western Europe. Um, strikes had shut down the British economy time and time again. The miners went on strike, and she would have none of it. Um, she basically fired the miners and brought in replacements and put the force of government against the union and ended that period of strikes. Um, there was a, an era known as the winter of our discontent in England. Um, when she became Britain's first female prime minister, she really changed that uh, sense of discontent of the British economy falling apart, of Britain <coughs> no longer having any sort of greatness. And she was the first prime minister to win three general elections in a row since 1832. Now, once, once I had dinner with Margaret Thatcher, and she was asked, what was her greatest achievement? She said immediately, the death of socialism. <laughs> well, she may have been premature in calling it dead. But nevertheless, that's what she thought of her achievement be, killing off socialism in Britain. She did curb the legal power of unions, curing what had become known by then as the British disease of constant strikes. She also privatized a great deal of British industry. She sold off government money-losing enterprises. And in general, they became profitable companies, British Steel, British Airways. British gas, British telecommunications, British cable and wireless. All of those were operated by the government during the 1970s, and all of them amazingly at a loss. It's sort of startling how that can happen, but I saw it happen when I lived in Pennsylvania. Um, alcohol distribution in Pennsylvania was something that was state controlled. You had to go to a state liquor store. And amazingly, they lost money. They had a monopoly on selling hard liquor and wine in Pennsylvania, and they lost money doing it. <laughs> That's sort of remarkable, but the British companies were the same way. Privatized, they ended up becoming quite successful. There was a resurgence of confidence and a clear moral sense, and also a recapture of the Falklands Islands. Um, the Argentine government attacked the Falklands Islands, drove the British out. She defended them and defeated Argentina in one way. That's not a great military feat, <laughs> but... <laughs> It was very far away from Britain and very close to Argentina, so there was a kind of geographic problem involved here. Also, British technology, this was really the first time the world saw a Harrier jump jet. And seeing British jets that actually took off vertically, that were, could be there and just go, that was the first time anyone had seen anything like that. And the war was televised, so people actually got to see the British jets doing this. It was actually very impressive and made people... <laughs> in Britain, feel a sense of confidence again. All the people outside Britain realized that Britain was still a country to be reckoned with. And the third of these leaders was Ronald Reagan, who was elected in the fall of 1980 in what appeared to be a very close election, up, really up until the weekend before it took place when he suddenly uh, emerged in a significant lead. By the end, it was actually a significant margin. The, uh, he got 51% of the vote, Carter got 41%, John Anderson was uh, a third party leader. Uh, Republican candidate. He, he was traditionally a Republican, but ran independently um, and didn't end up having a very large impact on the election overall. Reagan was re-elected in 1984 in a landslide. 500, 
25 electoral votes to Mondale's 13. Mondale took Washington, D.C. in his own home state. Now, Reagan was somebody who also had this idea of moral clarity. <coughs> Asked about his strategy on the Cold War, he said, here it is, we win, they lose. Okay? Um, of the four wars in my lifetime, he famously said, none came about because the U.S. was too strong. And so he argued in favor of a position of U.S. military strength. There was a sense that after Vietnam, which ended in American humiliation, after the episode in the desert trying to rescue our hostages in Iran, which ended in disaster, there was a sense that military strength in the United States was in the past, that the U.S. was in decline, that it no longer had the ability to have a large-scale influence or even to defend its own direct interests across the world. Reagan basically vowed to reverse that saying that military strength was a very important uh, value, not only for the United States, but really for the rest of the world, which could only exist in a kind of peaceful setting if it was protected by American power. He was also uh, an unremitting foe of communism. He said this to the British House of Commons in June 1982. What I'm describing now is a plan, and a hope for the long term, the march of freedom and democracy which will leave Marxism, Leninism, on the ash heap of history, as it's left other tyrannies, which stifle the freedom and muzzle the self-expression of the people. And so, for the first time, he was vowing not merely to contain communism, not merely to deal with its advances, but to actually destroy it. And that was something that really was new. In a sense, it was not a departure from the policy of containment. The whole idea behind containment was that if you prevent the Soviet Union and other communist nations from <coughs> aggression, that eventually communism will fall of its own accord. Reagan thought it was his job in part to give it a push, <laughs> that it was about to collapse. He was one of the few people who recognized, even early in the 80s, that it was actually very weak. In 1983, he gave a speech that has become known as the Evil Empire Speech. It was C.S. Lewis who, in his unforgettable screw tape letters, wrote, the greatest evil is not done now in those sordid dens of crime that Dickens loved to paint. It's not even done in concentration camps and labor camps. In those, we see its final result. But it's conceived and ordered, moved, seconded, carried, and minuted in clean, carpeted, warmed, and well-lighted offices by quiet men with white collars and cut fingernails and smooth-shaven cheeks who do not need to raise their voices. Well, because these quiet men don't raise their voices, because they sometimes speak in soothing tones of brotherhood and peace, because, like other dictators before them, they're always making their final territorial demand, some would have us accept them at their word and accommodate ourselves to their aggressive impulses. At the time, there was a big movement to uh, basically remove missiles from Europe and to disarm. But if history teaches anything, it teaches that simple-minded appeasement or wishful thinking about our adver adversaries is folly. folly. It means the betrayal of our past, the squandering of our freedom. So I urge you to speak out against those who would place the United States in a position of military or moral inferiority. In your discussions of the nuclear freeze proposals, I urge you to beware the temptation of pride, the temptation of blindly declaring yourselves above it all and labeling both sides equally at fault, to ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding, and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong and good and evil. Now, it's hard for me maybe to um, give you a sense of the reaction to this speech. How do you react to it? Yeah. No, I mean, like, it was good. I like it. I mean, right. I agree with that. Rhetoric, rhetoric, from a rhetoric standpoint, it was good. Um, I think it's very naive. In, in what way? Because it's, because it's painting communism as raw evil, straight out. Right. No right. For, uh, well, it certainly was that. No question about it. I mean, there's no black and white about it. And the problem with, yes, black and white politics is efficient, but it also leaves room to make very big mistakes. Ah, okay, so you might say, look, there's a, surely an oversimplification here. Well, yeah. I really like, I mean, it's really cool hearing a politician actually speak straightforward and matter-of-factly about something when you hear so many that are vague and kind of tiptoe around issues. Because the fact of the matter is that communism has done nothing but cause, like, death and starvation and awful things all the time. And uh -huh. if you're going to be weak from an international standpoint, you are asking for it. Because, like, the best form of diplomacy, I mean, this sounds like... Well, you know, what does an 18-year-old know about this? But I feel like I agree with that. Like, you have to be strong in order so other countries don't mess with you. That's all there is to it. And that, that's actually what stopped wars. It's not countries being, like, you know, trying to weaken themselves. So I, uh, right. I totally agree with that. And I wish we had more of a stance like that now, Right. Honestly. No, really. It's, it's very startling to hear some of these words now. But it was startling to hear them then because you might have noticed already that politicians have a tendency to say nothing. <laughs> 
They're like university administrators. They say something nice that they think everyone will want to hear and can bend in their own direction. And Reagan wasn't like that. He was a straight shooter in a sense. He put it directly out there. This is what he thinks, he tells you that. And even in 1983, that was a dramatic thing that few politicians did. Well, yeah. I was struck when you asked us for your opinion because my immediate urge upon you doing that is to look up a very, very large amount of history, even just concerning who he's addressing with this speech. Because this isn't an abstract speech. This is a speech which he's going to later try and use to push policy positions. And when he's talking about this, he's talking about some of his opponents who are sitting in Congress. And he's talking about some people who are over in the Eastern Bloc. And he's talking about a Soviet Union which had a lead. Did, did, did Gor was Gorbachev the leader of the Soviet Union yet at this time? I, I don't even remember. No, not yet. No. Okay. But I think it's interesting when I hear like claims like that, like where, where we have like this ideological black and white where... First of all, if we're going to say all communism has ever done is this, that requires a very large amount of history. But anyway, I'm, I'm very tempted to say that I don't really know how relevant how I would react to it now is to how I would react to it if I was actually living in the era and understood the context in which he was saying it. Oh, okay. Yes. I, I know that the Soviet Union reacted very badly to this, and the phrase evil empire became sort of a contention between the USSR and the U.S. in trying to come to peace agreements, and it was it was... Um, the USSR took it as evidence of Reagan's um, arrogance, and and so it seemed to create a greater a greater division that then both sides sort of had to, especially when Gorbachev came in, had to re sort of mend diplomatically. Um, so I I, I uh, think this speech is very interesting um, because well, it did sort of. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you at the time the reaction overwhelmingly was, oh, this is an oversimplification. This is going to alienate the Soviets. This is such a bad move. This is dumb. I remember having a bunch of people over at my house for dinner the night after <coughs> all of this, um, when it was the thing that everybody was discussing. And the people around the dinner table were basically denouncing Reagan, saying this was stupid, this was oversimplified, this was aggressive, this was something that was going to cause all sorts of negative diplomatic results, and so on and so forth. And there was one person at the table who had been quiet throughout this entire discussion. Didn't say anything. And finally, when this, the discussion stopped, she said, but it is an evil empire. That person was the daughter of <laughs> Mikhail Drekmara, the Ukrainian poet that we've talked about. She was the girl who, when she was seven, saw her father taken away in the middle of the night. And she was the person who said, then, she proceeded to tell us that story and proceeded to say, look, he's right. <laughs> it is an evil empire. It's something that we shouldn't hide from. It's something that shouldn't, you know, um, this is really what it's based on. It's based on force. It's based on oppression. It's based on taking poets and taking them out of their houses in the middle of the night. It's based on that kind of injustice. And there was really that sort of response to this speech. Some people thinking, oh, this is ridiculous. This is undiplomatic and crazy and blah, blah, blah. And others saying, but it's true. <laughs> okay, but it's true. And it doesn't do us any good to hide from that fact. Now, in some ways, this really was a turning point, partly because other presidents hadn't talked this way, certainly since Nixon and his emphasis on detente, but really not since, uh, gosh, maybe the early, the late 40s, early 50s. A Soviet general, anyway, later described that speech as, a, as the turning point in the Cold War. Why? Because he said he himself and other people he knew, people in leadership positions in the USSR, knew it was true. They knew it was an evil empire, and they couldn't look at themselves in the mirror in the morning any longer. Um, basically, his view was the whole Soviet system was built on denial. Built on denial that, of course, nobody knew that the official numbers on the economy were true, based on the idea that, yes, the ruble by this point was virtually worthless, that the Soviet Union was falling behind in an arms race with the United States and really could never hope to catch up. Um, a denial about the moral character of the Soviet Union, as involving the gulag and so on. People hid from all this. They pretended it wasn't happening. And suddenly, he said, we all had to face the fact that it was all true. <laughs> that, in fact, the economy was very weak. That we were holding vast numbers of people in prison camps and so on. Um, and so it wasn't, of course, just that. The war in Afghanistan, <laughs> we now know about this, was bleeding the USSR militarily and economically, making it very difficult for the Soviets to hold things together. Yes? 
I will say, regardless of whether the speech was correct about the character of the Soviet Union or not, the, the things that it would lead Reagan to do, he sacrificed, it seems like, almost every other fiscal goal he had for his policy with the United States to increase the amount of arms which we had and to bleed off more for the Soviet Union in terms of their economy. How can you hear that speech and be like, like, well, maybe he was right or maybe he was wrong about the policies of the Soviet Union? Like, you know, like, I'm just saying it's regard it's regardless, it's regardless, regardless. I know, but like, your stance on communism keeps being like, well, not all of history points to communism being That's bad, not what I'm saying. I'm saying regardless, he drove up the deficit. Well, well, yeah, we'll come to that. Um, there was an economic crisis when Reagan took office. In fact, when he was inaugurated, there was 15% inflation, a 21% interest rates, 18% on mortgages. It was almost impossible to buy a house. I think, uh, our, right I think then. our economic crisis is a little bit worse now, though. Uh, yeah, our economic crisis now doesn't look as bad because we calculate all these numbers differently. <laughs> if we use the methods of calculation that were operating in the late 70s and early 80s, the current inflation rate would be six, 15 or 16 percent, and unemployment would be around 15 percent. So actually, yes, we'd be worse off. Um, however, our interest rates are very low. That's the, the dramatic difference. We are busy devaluing the dollar in a way that wasn't going on in 1980. In any event, during Reagan's presidency, there were 20 million new jobs created. The GDP went up 27% in real terms. Manufacturing was up 33%. And so the economy did extremely well. Now, partly what Reagan did was continue the policy that Kennedy had started of cutting in income tax rates. The highest rate in the 50s was still 91%, left over from World War II. John Kennedy cut that to 70%. That fell under Reagan to 50%, and then later in a bipartisan tax reform to 28%. Um, it has since gone up. But there was a significant decline in taxes. And what happened actually was, as a result of that, um, well, the amount collected by the federal government, remarkably, really didn't change at all. When it was 91%, this is what was collected. And so the tax rate seems to make no difference. How is that even possible? Yeah. Yeah. Well, as that the rate goes down for them, there's a bigger, broader base for like the middle class. And exactly. So, and there's a broader base of people just paying more taxes at a lower rate, but there's more people doing it. Exactly. So, rates decline, but more people are paying, and the economy does better, so there's more money to tax and so on. Who paid the 91% tax rate in the 50s? Essentially nobody. Nobody's going to pay 91%. They found ways of sheltering their income, so the government actually collected less then and than it did much later. In any event, the result of that was that tax revenues nearly doubled, actually, during the 1980s and early 90s. And there was a significant deficit, but because spending increased, not really because deficit revenues fell. Anyway, let me talk about a foreign policy achievement. This is Reagan's speech at the Brandenburg Gate, where he went on and on with his speechwriters about a particular phrase, <laughs> which he insisted on including, even though his speechwriters kept taking it out. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. It was a challenge that gave people an aspiration to change the division between Western and Eastern Europe. And indeed, two years later, that happened. The Berlin Wall fell. And here you see it actually being taken apart, partly by people smashing at it with hammers, partly by cranes. Before this, th this was something that could not be crossed. People were shot. There were armed guards, and you were shot if you tried to escape from East Berlin. But on that evening, it all fell apart. Uh, and there were huge congregations of people on both sides of the wall. Tearing at it, here you see people slamming it with a hammer and ripping it apart. And around the same time, what had been known as the Iron Curtain, ever since Churchill's speech, crumbled. Okay, or lifted. I guess curtains lift, they don't crumble. Um, <laughs> what happened is not only the Berlin Wall fall, but in Hungary, people began, the government began to write uh, bills of exit so that they allowed people to leave the country and go to other Eastern European countries. What it meant is that it was possible to go to East Germany, get into East Berlin, and then escape to the West. And as soon as that began happening, people realized there was no longer any way to control people's travel and keep them in Eastern Europe. And so at that point, there really was overnight almost free travel 
people could leave Eastern Europe, the, the wall that had separated Eastern Europe and Western Europe came crumbling down. It was possible for the first time since the end of the Second World War for people to actually travel outside Hungary, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and other countries. Two years after that, Mikhail Gorbachev resigned and the Soviet Union itself fell. Here you see him signing his own resignation. And so, I want to conclude by saying the 20th century ended in a certain sense with a very optimistic note. Um, freedom seemed to be resurgent. Freedom was spreading from Western Europe and the Western Hemisphere throughout Eastern Europe, throughout the Soviet Union itself. Um, the forces of oppression in various parts of the world seemed to be in retreat. Um, that didn't last forever. <laughs> um, in the early 90s, Francis Fukuyama wrote a book talking about the end of history. That was his title. He thought, well, now we can just all live happily ever after. Um, that didn't happen either. <laughs> but I'll conclude with these words from Winston Churchill. The only guide to a man is his conscience. The only shield to his memory is the rectitude and sincerity of his actions. It's imprudent to walk through life without this shield, because we're so often mocked by the failure of our hopes and the upsetting of our calculations. But with this shield, however the fates may play, we march always in the ranks of honor.